This is called the Franklin Effect. People have a more favorable opinion of somebody who asks them for help than somebody who doesn't. The easier you make it for somebody to help, the more they are going to like helping you and, by extension, like you. Sometimes you're the person being asked and you have to be mindful of your time, but also be mindful of being generous with your time. But sometimes you're going to ask the wrong person and it might go badly. You have to get comfortable with rejection on this. And this is a great way to get comfortable with rejection too. If you ask somebody for help and they ignore you or say no, that's fine. Who cares about your idea? Just make something. Your perfect utopian vision of your idea will not meet what it is in reality. But that's okay. That's the process. Hey, welcome to the Create Unknown, the home of Make Something Mean Something. It is TCU's day. I am Kevin Lieber. With me, as always, is Matthew Tabor. Yeah, and we were just talking about the uh, the Bundy Ranch, weren't we? You remember the uh, the standoff that the Bundys had with with the U.S. government because because uh, not only is a video about that going to drop soon, but the guy making it is going to drop in with us. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how soon he'll be able to drop it because it, uh, I can can only imagine the amount of footage that Oki will be pouring through when he gets when he gets home back from his. Uh, is West Coast America vacation, but it's not a vacation. It's a it's a work project to detail this this the Bundy's life who yeah have fallen off the map. He is clearly enjoying it. Though. Yes, yeah. I mean, what he's posting on Twitter, all the photos and stuff, is really excellent. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's one of those issues that has just dropped off the map. And there were a lot of personalities involved, uh, and and big personalities too, in in terms of. Um, people being interesting. So given that subject matter and given what Oki's done on his other videos, I am, I'm really excited about this one in a way that, that I'm, I'm usually, you know, normally I'm like, Oh, I bet this will be good. I'll watch it. But no, this I'm, I'm truly anticipating. Yeah. Yeah. I know it was a big deal for him too. uh, whether or not the trip was even going to happen because you never know with these sort of things they are hard to coordinate and, and, uh, but he's really making it happen. So uh, I, yeah. I would recommend everybody go follow Oki before we talk to him next week, just so you can get up up to speed with, uh, you know, where he's been, the stuff he's been posting. It's OKI, Oki's Weird Stories on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Give him a follow. But uh, today, there's no guest. Okay. There's no guest. This is just no an, an, an intimate podcast where there'll be some some inspirational thoughts, some fists shaking at a cloud from an old man. And and that sort of thing, because, uh, well, you came across right. something. Two, two old men yell at clouds. OK, yes, yes. The grumpy old <laughs> men, Jack Lemon. And uh, <laughs> oh, God, that's that's one of our worst movie references. I, do people still watch that movie at all? I can't imagine younger people see that. No, no one even knows men. who Walter Matthau and, and Jack Lemon are anymore. It's a shame. Yeah. But I bet that movie still holds up. It's probably. You know what does hold up is the original Bad News Bears. Just watch that and get some Walter yes. Matthau goodness injected directly into your veins. See if you can get an uncensored cut, too, because it, it really is important to see uh, the language coming out of kids' mouths in that era compared to <laughs> what would be in a show now. <laughs> yes. There's, there's one single line from, from Tanner. Uh, the, the second baseman that pretty much says every single word that you would never hear a child say on in a movie now mm. at all mm. ever. Yes, in three seconds he covers a lot of ground. <laughs> it's a sign of the times, and uh, uh, you know it's important it to to get you know that experience every now and then. But uh, you got to know it. There, there is a uh, a concept that you came across recently that you mentioned to me. That uh, kind of folds into a lot of things that we talk about here on the Create Unknown that um, I know that you wanted to discuss today. Yeah. Yeah. So we've talked about 
We've talked about this concept in a lot of different ways, not explicitly, not giving it a name, not defining the thing. Well, it is a real thing and it has a name. Uh, so it, this is called the Franklin effect because it's named after Ben Franklin. He noticed that uh, <laughs> that asking people for, for favors or help, in his case, he asked somebody to borrow a book from them, made that person interested in him and made that person feel a little, uh, you know, a little friendly affection toward him, um, which is counterintuitive. You'd think that asking for help is is a burden that you are asking you're placing a burden on the person who is is delivering something to you um this is where it gets it gets nuanced because you've got to think about what it is and what it isn't um if you ask a friend for advice on something what you're really saying is i think you are in a better position to think about this than i am or you clearly know a lot about this or even i just really value your opinion that is distinctly different than calling somebody up and being like, hey, will you help me move on Saturday? Mm -hmm. Like that's that's a, a burden you're placing on them. And, you know, there's even that's not so bad because it's like, hey, I trust you with, you know, seeing and dealing with all of my stuff and that my entire life is going to get shipped out safely. Uh, but but yeah, this is a counterintuitive thing because we talk to all these people who do things on their own. We've done a lot of stuff on our own. and you'll see a theme in most everybody we talk to being fiercely independent in terms of, of what they do uh, creatively, all of this. And they tend to only not be independent when they hit a breaking point, you know, when they hit a point where they cannot keep up with it or they're severely unhappy, whatever. Uh, and a lot of times when, when you talk to somebody, they're like, yeah, I didn't want to put this person out. I know they're already busy. I didn't want to add to it, whatever. And it turns out that this is not just some little quip by Ben Franklin. It was, uh, it's been replicated in several studies um, that people have a more favorable opinion of somebody who asks them for help than somebody who doesn't. Now, Kevin, you've talked about this before when... Uh, in the context of emailing or calling experts on Vsauce 2 topics and how thrilled they often are to take time to give you a ton of information about what they do. Yeah. And I also think about this, like as you were describing it, I was thinking two things. One is that like certain types of people, certain types, certain personality types probably gravitate towards this naturally and don't even need this information <laughs> uh but yeah. but there's another personality type that i think might largely correlate with our listeners um with the type of sort of introverted people who are interested in making youtube content uh because that's a very solitary experience who need to hear this and wouldn't think that this was true and, and don't find this at all to be natural or self-evident and and do think of it as I don't want to burden someone else. I don't want to bother them. They're not going to like me if I'm annoying to them. Uh, that certainly is ha has probably been my default thought over the years when it comes to reaching out to people and saying, thinking like, nah, like if I ask this person, you know, for advice or help or you know, can you connect me with someone? That's going to be really annoying. I'm going to come across as needy and bothersome. So I'll just not do that. Well, that's probably a really bad idea. <laughs> that's probably like yeah. the, actually the opposite of what you should do. Uh, you probably should reach out to the person and say, hey, could you help me with this? Can you give me feedback on that? Of, of course, not to a point where it is annoying, not all day, every day. But every now and then, out once every six months, yeah, that's a really good idea yeah. for you and for them and for your relationship. This is where it really gets ratcheted up into the 4D chess game because you have to think about how you do this. So I don't know uh, what anybody else's experience on LinkedIn is like because I, I just don't know. I, I haven't talked to people about it. I don't know. I can tell you what it's like for me. Um. Periodically, I get messages from people 
I don't know at all. Uh, sometimes there's a mutual connection or two, but it's a salesy message. And they will ask for my opinion on something. What, you know, what do you think the state of YouTube is? What do you, you know, something that's relevant to, to work that I do. This is actually because the Franklin effect was used in, uh, Dale Carnegie's, Dale Carnegie's how to win friends and influence people, which is one of the classic like sales 101 texts. And so it's evolved as a strategy where like I can begin a relationship with uh, a potential client, uh, or anything, you know, professionally useful like that by asking their opinion on things. I have never once responded to one of those because I do consider that to be a, 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 a burden. Like I do not know you at all. Mm -hmm. There are scores of people who I, I want to help, uh, who ask for it, you know, and uh, like you rank lower than them because I, I know them or even have the tiniest little inkling of a connection with them. So for example, somebody who joins our discord server and asks a question, like they've already taken a step by joining the discord. Like that's something mm -hmm. that's not a, that's not a cold call. That's, that's not like you just shoot an email to somebody completely and totally cold. That's not going to work at all. People don't like that. You've got to start somewhere. You've got to be a little bit patient with this. You know, if there's, if it is somebody who is not already in your life in some capacity, mm -hmm. Um, I, I was really thinking about this. I was talking to uh, a guy named uh, Jack, who is at Dartmouth. Uh, he was talking about um, his his parents and and wanting to like appreciate them more and things like that. And I was like, "Hey, you know what? Ask them for help because this is the Franklin. This is a perfect uh, spot for it, where a parent would want a child to to say hey you know more about this thing than i do i value your perspective would you mind giving it to me that's the ideal thing a parent needs to be asked mm -hmm. uh and it virtually never happens like well you know do this they'll like it that's one of those really close you know like a, a well established relationship with family or like kevin i can ask you things we know each other if it's a cold email no 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 it's pre it's it's a shot in the dark that somebody would look at that and and think yes i want to take the time to do it you got to have something that is step one before you hit them with the ask uh and then the other part to this is exactly what you're asking so kevin you and i were talking about titles and thumbnails on videos an hour ago yeah if i send you let, let's say uh you know who i am we, we've never talked whatever but you, you know who i am i shoot you a dm on twitter and I say, can you help me title my next video and come up with a thumbnail concept? That's a lot of work. And that's, that's a really big ask. Mm -hmm. Now contrast that with me sending you a message that said, I really like the, the titles that you've used on your crime videos. What, can you give me some advice on how to title a video? Well, like, is there something I should be thinking about when I'm thinking about titling videos? Now that you are a lot more likely to respond to. Yeah. Or even like, Hey, do you like, uh, thumbnail a or thumbnail B? That's a really easy sure, thing yeah. to respond to. Yeah, it, uh, it does. Well, but this, yep. this goes back to sort of your example about like, Hey, can you help me move? I mean, there was, there was a actually really funny, <laughs> there was a really funny one that, that blew up sort of on Twitter recently in which someone was freaking out about, uh, uh, friend, asking your friend to pick you up at the airport. This turned into like yeah. a whole thing where it was like, don't ask me to pick you up at the airport. Like just take an Uber. Now uh, I have like a, like kind of mixed reactions to this. I think it, this is going to sound weird. It kind of depends on the airport. <laughs> like if it's LAX, <laughs> man, do not ask me to pick you up at LAX unless we're like, <laughs> unless you're family. <laughs> That place is an absolute nightmare. You know, if it's like, a, <laughs> this is going to get into like airport weeds, but yeah, uh, this is li well, li there is a big difference between airports. Yes. Yes. It's a factor, It's a huge yeah. difference between something like JFK and LAX. Um, then, right. you know, uh, Palm Springs or some like small airport. 
It's a big difference. But the ease of the thing factors in. It does. One right. One. It does. Yeah, yeah. That's the point. That's the point. It goes back to what you were saying. Yeah. Like you have to meet somebody sort of halfway with the ask and not have it actually be a problem and a burden and a, and a pain. But, um, yeah. But I'd like to go back to what, yeah, I, I didn't really answer your question earlier about the the experts, like reaching out to mm -hmm. Robin Dunbar about the Dunbar's number video and him actually right. responding. You know, part of why I think that he did respond was that I gave him something to respond to. So I s already sent him my script. It was like, hey, I wrote a script to do a YouTube video about your idea. Can you yep. just look at this and let me know if there's anything, you know, contentious or wrong, uh, anything that you would change, anything uh, you should, you know, would like to flag? That is way easier of an ask on Robin Dunbar's time than to s float some nebulous like, hey, I was thinking of doing this thing and I was wondering if you'd have time yes. to like talk to me about it and... No, 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 no. Like that sucks. <laughs> That's a bad way of going about what we're talking about. A much better way is to already have done kind of the hard part and give them the easy part or the easiest part to respond to. Yeah, that's a really big factor here is it's got to be easy uh, to respond to. And it's that's that's a, a really effective email strategy, by the way, is that you ask somebody an explicit question. So that they, it's it's a yes or a no, or it's whatever. Um, you don't, if you ask them something generally or like kind of, sort of, do you like this? No, no, it's going nowhere. It's, it's going to be very slow, even if you do get to the right spot. It's like Kevin said with the thumbnail options, like, hey, is A or B better? Well, that's really easy to respond to. It's A or it's B, and I can tell you why I made that choice. So the easier you make you make it for somebody to help, the more they are going to like helping you and by extension, like you. This is something I really blew when I, when I was younger. And it's, it's a, a, a curse for people who can do a lot of things themselves because they don't need to ask uh, for as much help with things. So there are all these, these ways that conspire. So like uh, Kevin, when you started on YouTube, you knew how to film you were writing your material, you were editing those videos. That that's that's a lot. Like that's a lot of areas of expertise for one person. You could get by without help on those things. As opposed to, you know, if, if I were to make a YouTube channel right now, I cannot edit the videos. You know, I, I would be forced to get help whether I'm paying for it or asking for it. Um but uh this is it's something you got to do and you've got to get in the practice of asking for help. So we talked to so many people who DIY their stuff, got very successful. And then if they do get comfortable with asking for help, they're, they're not actually very good at it. So they haven't done it much. <laughs> it, it, it makes a difference to get a little bit of practice early on in asking for help. Then it's not weird when you need it. You're comfortable with it because that is a two way street. Yes, you've got to finesse uh, things to make it easy for the person to help you, but you yourself have to be able to ask without anxiety. You know, it, it's got to be clean on both ends. And that's something I didn't do. I didn't think I needed to do. Now I know. Uh, I wish I had taken advantage of so many people's expertise. Turns out they would have supported me more, liked me more. They would have had a, a little bit of buy-in into the projects I was doing. No, I thought I was doing it the right way by, by just running and gunning myself. Uh, there is value in that. You figure out how to do a lot of things and you get an appreciation uh, for them. That's really good. But I totally swung and missed on asking for help. I totally blew it. It's one of my major regrets is not doing that earlier and not getting practice and how to do it well. Yeah. And, and the other thing I thought of real quick about doing this is that um you do really want to show that you're serious uh, i guess that was the other thing I, I wanted to say about like uh, for example uh just leading with i've already written this script it's about your thing robin dunbar can you comment on it 
that shows that this is a real thing, that I'm a serious person. Like I have done the work already. Uh, and the reason that that's important is because, well, first of all, I've separated myself probably from 99% of people asking Robin Dunbar for help because most, yes. most people just talk about things that they're going to do. Uh, they haven't actually done the thing. So you can really get a leg up in this scenario by, again, even with the thumbnail idea of there's a huge difference between help me come up with a thumbnail idea and, hey, here are like three different styles that I'm trying to decide between. Can you give me some direction? That's a, th those are completely different things. The second version shows that you're, you've already done a lot of the work for the other person and you're just asking them to sort of chime in and, and give you some feedback. It's not like, hey, let's just start from scratch. There's a big difference between, yeah, like help me build a house or, you know, you know can you help me install my stereo or, or TV or something like that? Yeah, um, I, I was thinking about this in terms of inventions. And it, Kevin, I know you're a big Shark Tank watcher. Yes. Uh, this comes up, what you just said comes up on that, on that show a lot, where it's a very different scenario when somebody comes up with an idea. And they present their idea and somebody like Mark Cuban is like, yeah, go get sales. I, I want to, you know, right. <laughs> I have nothing to work with here. Right. You've got to get sales data and then we'll talk right now. You just have a really good idea. Um, I, I came up with something that satisfied a little need of mine in the workshop. Uh, I like it. It's a, it's, it's a good idea, I think, but it was just that I had to make a prototype of it and see if it worked. Uh, and before I ask for help on something like a provisional patent, uh, yeah, I need the thing to be working. So I send somebody a picture and I'm like, Hey, this is, uh, the thing I put together. This is how it works. I need help with this specific next step. That is totally different than I have an idea. Can you help me turn the idea into reality? <laughs> I will get help on that provisional patent step. I will not get help on the idea one, because I have gotten that question a thousand times from people who have a good idea for a YouTube channel. And it's the same thing every single time. Go make a video, shoot it on your phone. Doesn't matter. Whatever it is, go make a video and then we'll have something to talk about. I really do not care unless it's somebody that's like a Kevin Lieber uh, that has an established portfolio or track record and they want to, they have an idea to do something new. That's a different scenario. I'm interested in, in what that person has to say, because I don't worry about, about the real step in it. It's going to happen. Uh, if that's not there, no, you've got to do something. And if you have something real, like Kevin, having written that script and sent it to Robin Dunbar, it's, Oh wow. It's everything. It's, <laughs> it's something real to evaluate the person knows their time isn't going to be wasted. Uh, they they know it's it's a useful venture for everybody. It's worth yeah, it's worth good. responding to. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. It's like it's worth responding mm -hmm. to this. This is a this is a real thing. Yeah, like you said, this is a real thing. And, and that uh, Shark Tank analogy is fascinating because I ha wouldn't have made that connection, but it does come up all the time on that show. Where, like you said, wow, th this idea seems great. It seems to solve a problem. I could see people being interested in this, but you have no sales, which means I have no idea if people actually want this. There's no way to know until people uh, actually respond with their wallet. Are people going to buy this thing or are they not? Because there's been, it doesn't matter how theoretically great your product is, it just if no one wants to buy it, it's not a business. And if it's not a business, then I have nothing to invest in. And that's the whole point of that show. So that that is a great illustration of the difference between showing up with an idea and showing up with something something real. It's everything. Yeah, there's a level of seriousness to it that is is just uh it it the the hook sinks in at that point because there's something for the hook to sink into. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it fits with, with the prior stuff too, where they've, t by the time they're asking for something and that's what shark tank is, they're asking for investment and help 
guidance, whatever is appropriate mm-hmm. for that business. They're coming in to help because they've taken steps so that it's not weird to ask for that. They are not running in on stage with a gun and asking for help. <laughs> uh, That'd be a good it, episode. It would be. Uh, they're not you know, shooting a cold email to Mark Cuban saying, I've got a great idea. Can I have $10 million to make it happen? Mm-hmm. Like that, that's, that's not going to work. I'm not saying you need to jump through 19 hoops. Like you have to, to get on shark tank to advance every idea before you're ready to ask somebody for help, but you, you got to do something. Uh, and usually the thing that you do presents itself as you're doing the thing that, that the idea is about, you know, you get a sense of how to take that first step when, you know, back to Kevin's example, you write the script, uh, you didn't, you didn't really know what you were going to ask Robin Dunbar until you hit sticking points in that script or you hit points where you wanted to really double check and make sure that you had it right. Mm -hmm. That would, it wouldn't have been possible to ask him anything specific without you doing something first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you've been sipping, but you've got it all wrong. It's time to commit to the leaf. We've embraced the smoothness and surprising pick-me-up that tea provides. I literally drink it all day long, nearly a gallon a day, and it powers me through research, script writing, and forums on websites that I refuse to name here. But we don't drink normie NPC tea. We drink cultured and refined anime tea from the Dragon's Treasure. Kevin still likes the gunpowder green called Space Cowboy, and I've sampled nearly 40 Dragon's Treasure teas at this point. Lately, I've been slamming black teas like Kentucky Bourbon and Liquefied Berserk Despair. Scottish Breakfast is deep and peaty, and I smooth it over with Sebastian's Morning Earl Grey, which has the best vanilla cream taste I think I've ever had in a cup. Give me a pot of that with a hot meatball sub from Sal's Pizza and Brooks Barbecue Chicken to wash down my last meal on death row. I highly recommend the sampler pack you'll want to try everything just like I did. I literally have not had one tea that I wouldn't be happy to reorder. The Dragon's Wings membership fuels new tea experimentation and the Tea of the Month Club provides a regularly scheduled surprise. And when you order from the Dragon's Treasure using code CREATE, you'll get 10% off your order. That's 10% off using the code CREATE at thedragonstreasure.com. The link's in the description. But but overall, I think that probably a lot of people in sort of this sphere of being an online creator or, you know, hoping to be an online creator, dabbling in it, I would go out on a limb and say probably most tend to lean on the side of, well, I don't want to bother anyone. You know, I don't, I don't want to be annoying. I don't. I, That's valid. And, and that is, yeah. You you, nobody, you be annoying. nobody wants yeah. to be annoying. Nobody wants other people, you know. <laughs> to think that they're annoying, that sucks. <laughs> um, but the whole point of, yeah, the Franklin effect is to say, hey, you know what? It turns out that not only might you not be considered annoying, these this person might like you more, you know, depending on, like you said, um, essentially this sliding scale of how you present what it is you're asking help on. But the point is, Ultimately, you might build a stronger relationship than if you just, I mean, how are you going to build any relationship if you never talk to the person and you never reach out at all? Well, well, here's a way to reach out that that maybe will lead to more collaboration between you. And that's really how yep. things grow. Yeah, that's exactly what what was part of Ben Franklin's initial example was uh, asking for that book. Um that started a relationship based on, you know, whatever type of book it was, you know, they were clearly mentally kindred spirits on this one topic or whatever. And that kicked off, that kicked off the rest. I mean, we, you and I started talking, actually, this is kind of funny. We, we really started by helping each other with, with small projects, didn't we? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's pretty much it. And it, it built from there. Uh, I did not really get anywhere with anything on my own. <laughs> I, I just didn't. I mean, I did, but it was a very slow, awful grind. And I understand now that it didn't quite have to be that way. And when I did interact people or interact with people, it, I don't want to say that I, I would try to impress them. 
but it was like, I would try to pre- present myself in such a way that they would take me seriously. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was the wrong way to do it. That was the wrong way to do it. I mean, you've got to have that body of work. You got to have that thing to present that they should use to take you seriously. But, but there's an element of humility in there where you can, you can relax. And I, I didn't have the confidence to relax and be helped. You know, it was like, go, go, go. I need to show that I'm extremely motivated that I uh, have, I'm in a position to do this thing, whether it was an aptitude or knowledge thing, whatever. I'm like, no, 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 no. Now I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do anything like that now. I'd totally relax about it. I would play way more of a long game. Um, I would do, I would make people comfortable. That would be my, my aim through all of it is to do something useful to me that put them in a really good position and made them comfortable. It, it wouldn't be possible to be more of a 180 from what I did 20 years ago. And what I, and life sucks. What I think is funny about that and why, and the point of, actually talking about this is because I do think a lot of this is a little counterintuitive, at least coming from like our side of the, like the personality space, because what you're describing as something that you felt was a weakness, which is to have to reach out and ask for help is ironically a strength. It's totally stronger, a strength yep. to be able to have the self-confidence it, it's completely counter counterintuitive that you would think the strong yeah. person doesn't need help. I don't. I could. I could move <laughs> this. Right. I could move this boulder by myself. I don't need it. I don't need help. No. 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 Regardless of whether you can move the boulder by yourself, it's better to ask somebody for help, and it actually shows that you have more self confidence in doing so, not less. Yeah. Yeah. It's. <sighs> See, that's why I don't feel bad about it. And I'm totally comfortable saying I did this wrong and I sucked at what I was doing. I'm okay with that because it is so counterintuitive that I look at it and I think, how could I have possibly known this? How could I be expected <laughs> to, to know uh, that, that you know, the opposite of what makes sense is actually uh, the, the good thing here? Mm-hmm. Like, no, no, no. There's no expectation that, that I would have figured this out 20 years ago. So I don't feel bad that I didn't. But I, I, I want to make this less personal because one of the uh, one of the specific studies here uh, shows how this works in in like non personal ways. Okay, it's not just talking to an expert or sending a message to you know me or Kevin or something like that. So in the sixties, uh, a study that was designed to monitor how people felt after. Being asked for help uh, in different ways, and also the control group of not being asked at all. It. I'm trying to think how to summarize this. Uh, there was a Jeopardy type show, a, a quiz competition, where the people playing won money. Now, after the competition, they were broken down into three groups by the researchers. One third of them, uh, the researcher went to them and asked them to give the money back because his story was that he'd used his own money to pay <laughs> for uh, the prizes and he had bills to pay. He was short of money, whatever. Another third were asked by a third party. In this case, it was a secretary uh, to return the, the money. And her story was that it was money from the psych department and they were running low on funds. So it's like, be a good guy. Don't take money away from the psych department. Third group, not approached at all. So they just got to keep the money. All of these people, all three groups were asked after how much they liked the researcher who conducted the Q&A. The group that liked him the least wasn't even the one that, that was never approached. It was the one being approached by an intermediary, by the secretary. That actually made people like them less, like, like the researcher less by having an end around uh, backdoor way. It, it, I, maybe it felt slimy to them. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know, but they, they felt worse than keeping the money. <laughs> so, uh, it, well, everybody's going to feel worse than giving away money than keeping the money. But I mean, then uh, being asked directly by the researcher, uh, when they felt like they were helping him, mm-hmm. they felt better about him. Mm-hmm. So they didn't know him. This was purely a, a psych study. Uh, they didn't know what they, you know, what they were 
you know, really being studied for, right? They just play a game and then this thing happens. Uh, but that's a really powerful example because they, yeah, they have no connection to any of these people. Just a situation presents itself out of the blue and there are three clear conclusions from those three examples. Um, so I, the reason I like that so much is because it shows asking in a bad way can do harm. Mm -hmm. So using that thing, that's like giving your, your friend, the note to pass to the girl that says, do you like him? Yes or no. She's going to be more, a lot more likely to circle no on that than if you walk up to, to the person yourself and, and ask them out. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it sounds like I found that fascinating. The, the people who were asked by the secretary felt kind of betrayed more, and because they were not yeah. helping a person. Whereas if the person directly says, "Hey, could you help me out?" then they're like, "All right, you know, this is a good, it's a good guy. I'll help him out." Whereas, yeah, when it's yeah. disassociated, it feels like, "Well, I just got tricked. Right. I just got screwed." This and this factors into the ad campaigns that are uh, emotionally stark. So like the ones with pets, specific animals are shown in very bad conditions, and then you're asked to donate money to help them. Well, that gives you the impression. I mean, you know that, that the, the animal on the screen is not the hundred percent beneficiary of your donation, but it reinforces that animals just like this are being helped. It's a very specific call to action and you feel real about it. It's, they do the same thing with, with children in areas of hardship. Right. You know, it's always like, here's who, whomever and she's four years old and here's what she worries about. If they just ran an ad that said, well, you know, life is, is very bad in Syria right now. Would you, would you like to give some money to alleviate that? Uh, it's essentially the same ask mm -hmm. for the same exact reason, but it's completely and totally different for the person being asked. Mm -hmm. That makes a, a huge, huge difference. And I think that sort of thing was at play with this study where this general, like, you want to be a good guy and help out the psych department? Like, I don't know. That's slimy. I win some money and, it, you know, you ask for it back. That's a totally different ask than, you know, I use my own money and I am overextended. Can, can you help me out by returning that? Now, in the same case, you're giving the $20 back. You're even giving the $20 to, to help people in both cases, but it feels totally, totally different. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there really is an art to this and it's, it's, it's hard. And that's why I'm, uh, it's so important to me, uh, to say, you got to start on this early because you've got to get good at it. And it's not easy. It's not the kind of thing that you're going to nail every time. And you're going to blow it. A lot of times you're going to make people feel weird. You're going to ask for too much. You're going to ask for too little. You're going to uh, ask the wrong person because that that's one thing that oh, I would yeah. want to mention is that because oh, yeah. it does work both ways too. where, um, well, well, I guess these are two different points. One point is that sometimes you're the person being asked and you have to be mindful of your time, but also be mindful of, um, being generous with your time, you know, when, when it's applicable and maybe sometimes when it's not applicable and you, you, you do go out of your way and, and, um, you know, help someone when you don't even have the time. That's a, but you know, it, it happens both ways. But the, the other thing is that sometimes you're going to ask the wrong person and it might go badly. And I, I have, uh, an <laughs> there are not a whole lot of YouTubers that I don't like. It's, uh, definitely. I got a long list. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't. It's less than my list is, is epic. I know. I know. Well, you know, there are many differences between you and I, this is one of them. I think I think that my list is like less than one hand's worth of of YouTubers. I'm like, you know, that person sucks. Uh, one of the people who I think sucks is someone who I asked for help and they ignored me. Oh yeah, and, and you know this story. I'm not going to tell the story on the podcast, so, so I'll just be vague about it. But um, one day we will. One day we'll let it all out. I could. I could. It won't be nearly as exciting as this buildup is <laughs> no, no. leading it, leading no. you to believe. But it was the snub, as Charles says. Yeah, it was a scenario uh, in, in which episode, yeah. I asked for very little of this person's time on a uh, on a really specific thing that I couldn't ask just any old person about. But it was a, mm -hmm. a connection that we both had, and uh, 
just completely blew me off for no reason. Just, I don't know. And you checked in later too. Oh, so a because times. people do get a couple times. shockingly busy. Yeah. I like there are people probably in the episode. Well, yeah, I see Ducky in there. I, I owe Ducky a DM. Um, I am just way, way, way behind on all things internet that happens. And you gave a lot of space. You gave a lot of space and checked in a couple times. And then it's like, you know, two, three times you're done. Like you, what else can you do? You did it. You were perfect about it. It was everything we're talking about here. You did it. There was an established relationship. You asked them something that was simple, that really did take advantage of the expertise that you value. It, it was served up on a tee for them and they snubbed you. Yeah. Just, yeah. Flat out. Just complete. Like, ah, eh, I'm not bothering with this. It's like, okay, well, you are, you're on my short list of people who suck now. <laughs> So yeah. keep, yeah. keep that in mind that that is part of this game. We want to help you make something and mean something. And we say that phrase all the time because when you're making something and you know it means something, even if it's just to you, that's when you feel pretty good about what you're creating. The support for the Create Unknown in recent weeks has been incredible. Animators, artists, musicians, YouTubers, aspiring filmmakers, comedians, it is crazy how talented everybody in this community is. Consider joining the Create Unknown Patreon. Every dollar that comes through goes straight into the podcast and its community. That means more highlights videos. It means a big Minecraft project that's on the way. And eventually we'd like to manufacture custom piss bottles so you never have to leave your battle station. And being a patron unlocks participation in all of our live recordings. You've seen the roster of guests we've had. Having access to their minds is a unique opportunity. You can go to patreon.com slash thecreateunknown or click the link that's in the description. Every little bit helps and your support means absolutely everything to us. Patreon.com slash thecreateunknown. Links in the description. We appreciate you, Space Cowboys. It is, uh, and sometimes that's not going to work out. Yeah. It isn't. And Dan Latch is, is asking, like, when's the right time to follow up on an unanswered email or DM? Sometimes you're just not going to get one. I mean, you shoot your best shot. You, if necessary, pop it back on their radar. And if if it doesn't happen, like, it's probably not going to. And you just have to accept that, you know? And you accepted that this person was not going to help you. Like, in that example, Kevin, you realized you were not going to get a response and that was over. So you... Moved yeah, on, and but asked somebody I, else. I think that then we can give like some kind of general heuristic. I mean, I, th I think it depends on the relationship and it depends on the ask. So I don't want to be too vague about it. And you're going to have to gauge a little yeah. bit of that on your own. It also depends on the timeliness of it. You know, there are factors you have to consider. Yeah. But like generally speaking, I think after a few days, you give the person a few days to respond. And if they haven't, that's what I said in the episode. Show. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they probably have forgotten about it after a few days and it's OK to bump it. Um, certainly yeah. after I oh, think 72 uh, hours is a good window. Yeah, I think that's the first window. Uh, definitely. I was going to say a week. If it's been a week, definitely. Yeah. That's that's been plenty of time to check in. But uh, time to bump. yeah, after after like two check ins. So now you've contacted them three times total. It's rough to do like a fourth, but I've, I've gotten those fourth check-ins with people that I, that it's usually, I shouldn't say people. It's like usually companies, companies that I'm just not going to respond to. <laughs> so That's some right. people, some of those yeah. companies will respond four or five, bump four or five times. Oh, God. they'll do that. Yeah. And this happens with the podcast too, with like PR firms, pitching guests, they will be like, just, just wanted to see if you saw this. I'm like, yes, I saw it and I ignored it 17 times in a row because I don't like anything about what you've just sent me. Uh, and I am so disinterested in it that I did not take the time to just reply no. Oh, and then they, they <laughs> give you that, that ridiculous guilt trip final email that's like, this will be my last time I try to reach out to you. And I'm like, good. I hope so. Yeah, I'm thrilled. Yeah, that is, I mean. This will be my last. <laughs> I know then that it's the last time I have to ignore you. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Dan Latch says, what if the 72 hours ends on the weekend? Don't bump it on the weekend. I, I would yeah. never bump that something. bump into the ether. I would never bump something on the weekend. Ever, 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 ever. Wait until Monday for sure. Because you And I try not to Monday morning because people are always like 
doing their priority stuff or beginning their routine or whatever, I'll bump like noon on Monday is when open bumping season starts. Yeah. Monday is a cat. Monday morning is like a catch up typically Mm -hmm. gauntlet of stuff that you can also get buried beneath. But, um, yeah, not, not the weekend people usually are not going to be, you don't, you don't want to be that person trying to get something from them on the weekend. You know, I do want to reiterate too, that you have to get comfortable with rejection on this. And this is a great way to get comfortable with rejection too, because you know that the person doesn't owe you anything. Like there's an expectation that it's okay for them to say no, because it totally is. If you ask somebody for help and they ignore you or say no, like that's fine. You know, you would want to say no to, to a lot of situations and people. So you don't really feel bad about getting ghosted or getting a no. You don't feel great about it, but you don't feel really bad. Uh, it's, it's nice to put stuff out there and get a lot of rejections and realize that's not a big deal, that it's completely okay. So it's a good like kiddie pool to, to uh, learn rejection in. You know, it's a sandbox that's safe for rejection. It's low stakes. And then when it starts yeah. to happen on a it low stakes. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. When it happens on a grander scale, it, it's a lot easier to deal with. Ducky says in the episode chat, started feeling nice about rejection recently. Yeah, you should. Uh, it's completely rational that you'll be rejected. <laughs> it, it just more times than not. Way more times than not is what I was going to say. I mean, yeah. that's kind of how everything works is rejection, 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 rejection acceptance. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, there are a million billion stories, certainly in the entertainment industry of this, where it doesn't matter who you are. You could be Ryan Reynolds trying to get Deadpool made. And it took you like 10 years and a million meetings and a lot of begging. And you're one of the biggest stars in the world trying to make a superhero movie which is the most popular thing in the industry and you're still getting rejected over and over and over again. So, I mean, you know, if Ryan Reynolds had to go through, I don't remember how many years of rejection to make Deadpool, which guess what ended up being a huge hit. Um, you know, what do you think your experience is going to be like? It's going to be a whole lot of no before it's going to be a lot of no. Some, someone miraculously says yes. Once, uh, once you mentioned the, the entertainment side, um, I, I immediately thought of Sylvester Stallone with Rocky. He wrote a script that he had no track record to speak of at all. Um, I think at that point, his only credit was being in a softcore porn, uh, which I, I, I forget the real name, but after his popularity, they renamed it Italian stallion. <laughs> um, So my point is that he was not coming from a place of professional authority, but what he really wanted was to star in the movie he'd written. So it's like, I want somebody to produce Rocky here, but I need to be Rocky. And that's a, that's a brutal sell in the industry. Mm -hmm. You you can't do that uh, unless you're (laughs) really established. If Tom Cruise writes a script and and says, yes, I've written this, but I need to be the lead. Then we've got a conversation. But when failed porn actor from five years ago and no experience has a, a script written on a succession of napkins and bill envelopes, like, no, this is a non-starter. Uh, and he had about to go a through a who hell loses. of a lot. <laughs> like none of, about a boxer who loses. None of this is good. That's right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, you know the... Uh, the humanity long, like proof of, of sports stories, people loving a victor going back to the ancient Olympics. So I have no body of work at all. I sound pretty, pretty odd for a leading man. I have an accent that would not normally be associated with a leading man in 1976 or seven. Uh, and I'm going to take that, that 2,500 year old formula that everyone demonstrably loves. And I'm just going to do the opposite of that. How much will you give me? This is the shittiest pitch of all time. (laughs) It's horrible. It's absolutely awful. So you can imagine the straight rejection, uh, that, that he received and he kept, you know, pounding away at it. And yeah, I, I don't know if I believe this, um, but he claims to have been thrown out of 1500 offices. Uh, and that is a high number because he went to offices more than once. So 
it wasn't 1500 unique offices. He had some return viewers that kicked him out the door. Uh, I don't know if I believe that number, but I believe it was very, very high and it surely was in the triple digits. Um, my best friend in college, uh, as we were graduating, he sent out 50 treatments of a South Park episode that he'd written. He sent out 50 of them. And if I remember right, 49 ghosted him and one sent him a rejection letter. Wow. That, I mean, hey, he's a college kid who says, I'm funny. I want to do comedy writing. <laughs> Here's an example of me doing it. Uh, that's low odds. He's since made a fantastic career in, in TV production. You know, it worked out, but he, wow, did he get rejected in yeah, one fell swoop there with, with that batch of 50. I so, I so distinctly remember him packaging up the 50 envelopes and taking them to the post office. And it was kind of a sight to see, you know, as an armful of these perfect things, you're like, shit, he's really shooting his shot here. And then, you know, zilch, but the Rocky thing I love just because now we know how it turned out. We know that movie was amazing. The fact that he lost is a, a tremendous aspect of that movie's importance. You know, how it was handled, and it certainly worked out for Stallone himself. Um, it won the Academy Award, didn't it? Did it literally win Best Picture? I, I think so. I'm pretty sure. I think so. I'm pretty sure it won Best Picture. Yeah. It's one of the best sports movies of all time because it's not even a sports movie. Boxing is an afterthought in that movie. It's not at all about boxing. It's genius. So somebody eventually bit. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? allows somebody to do that wiffle butter confirms rocky did win best picture um kevin how how do you do that because because i look at somebody like that and i think well they have to be a little off oh yeah you really have to be something has to be a little bit wrong with you to do that you know like when you're talking to psychic pebbles and uh michael cusack and just all these people who were grinding irrationally for years and years and years and getting nothing from it something has to be a little off (laughs) <laughs> there's an obsessive quality to it without any question yeah. you can't not be obsessed with it i think that's one thing that we've learned over and over and over again doing this podcast and everyone that we've talked to there's just some little obsessive screw loose or too tight uh in their brain that kind of leads them to being like yeah i will just do this i mean that's why actually I've been liking lately asking people like the odd ones out to, uh, uh, you know, are you consciously trying to scale back on your obsession? Because I don't have to ask mm. you if, if you're working hard or I don't have to ask you yeah. what motivates you to work hard because it's natural to them. Like it's not even a question and it's not even really something I think that they could answer as an actionable piece of advice like oh um all you do is xyz and then you become obsessed with making cartoons seven days a week 12 hours a day that's not a thing (laughs) like some people have that or they don't i remember uh when i was um interning at conan o'brien there was a uh one of the artists who worked there pierre uh who who had a, a some recurring skits on that show like uh Pierre's recliner of rage. Pierre Bernard's recliner of rage. If anybody remembers that, I'm sure there's there's clips of that on YouTube. Pierre Bernard's recliner of rage. This is literally one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. That was the joke of the recliner of rage. Is that like this unbelievable, like impossibly nice person is going to get angry about something? That's why that was the entire skit. Anyway, it's a good setup. I remember him telling a story about how. I mean, this is a guy who would work, you know, however many hours in the office for Conan on artwork, drawing, you know, things that would be used in skits, drawing things that would be used in bumpers or, you know, interstitials, whatever, just just doing artwork for the show all day in his office, drawing artwork for the show. Then he would go home, draw all night and forget to go to sleep and forget to eat. Like all of a sudden it would be like three o'clock in the morning and he hadn't eaten all like since lunch at the office. And it's like, oh yeah, I should probably have like a bowl of cereal or something. That's awesome. That's, that's, that's how this guy lives. 
you can't yeah. just tell somebody to do that. They're either going to do that or they're not, you know? So that's the tough part, I think, with a lot of creative stuff. I feel like I feel like we've stumbled on a little bit of a truth here. Because as you were talking about that, and, and Pierre, who hopefully Pierre has not drawn himself to death. What you just described is a recipe to to have like a mix of carpal tunnel and heart problems at 29. <laughs> uh, so I hope you're doing okay, Pierre. And, and uh, Charles popped a video of <laughs> the recliner of rage into the episode chat. And just from the still of it, it looks funny. <laughs> so it is. <laughs> um, I tell me if you think this is true, Kevin, I feel like kind of topic selection is a big part of this because my thought here is that if you get rejected from something that you are really into and that you really love, you care a lot less about the rejection. It deters you a lot less. If it really gets to you and bothers you, I feel like it's a bad fit for you that that project is. Um, do you think there's anything to that? Because I think of, again, the Stallone example where he was so into it that I don't think he took it very personally being told hundreds of times, no, not only no, but you as the leading man, definitely not. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's probably some level of like a responsibility or blame switch that you will do in that scenario psychologically in which if you really believe, you know, Rocky's going to be great or you're Ryan Reynolds and you really think this Deadpool movie is going to be great. When people reject you, you, you can just chalk it up to them being wrong or them being idiots or them not getting it. Like, I mean, okay, let's let's talk about a personal example with us when we went through several pitch meetings talking about t uh, TV oh. shows that we <laughs> that we came up with that we were trying to oh. develop that mm, pretty much nobody got. Like pretty much right. nobody really got. There was one production company that we felt good. They got it with got uh, it, yeah. them understanding the concept and why it was interesting. And, uh, and they sent us anthrax in the mail. Yeah. And that ended up going nowhere for, you know, whatever reason, but man, you can, <laughs> because TV, you, you can have these conversations in which you try your utmost at communicating an idea and it's just not going to get through, uh, whether they're just not listening or perhaps it is a failure on your own part of not painting the picture better. It could be, I guess, any number of things, but the point is you can tell whether or not they get it. And if they don't get it, it's really easy to not get offended by that and just say, hey, you know, they don't get it. And that's kind of their problem, not my problem. I think yeah. that's a big difference. It is. It is. I'm, I'm fascinated by, by all of this stuff, but I want, to, this, I want to interject something that's related but not because it's actually happening in real time this second. And it's relevant to the, cre the create unknown. So the people who are in the discord, who uh, are familiar with, with the people in the community will know the imaginary badger people. Uh, Sid Polk is uh, one of them. Sheeb and W quiz, uh, NRM, who's quite active in the discord, uh, pigeon, they all work on this and they, they've, they've done it. They've printed a comic called Halcyon and it, they finally went to a con and set up a booth and sold their comic. They sold the issues of the thing that they've been working on forever. I, uh, they ask for help on this stuff a lot and perfectly appropriately. Uh, they ask for advice from a lot of people. If it's something that uh, you want to pitch to the crowd, they might throw it in the discord. If it's something that a specific person needs to be asked, they'll ask that person. Uh, they certainly ask each other uh, for help and have a very good system for doing this. But it, I, I realized uh, because Sid Polk shot me a message, you know, 20 minutes ago or so uh, saying, um, you know, hey, do you do you want a, a, a copy? Because uh, he's in the U.S. for this con. He can drop it in the mail. And the very first thought I had was, no, 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 no. Do not give us copies of this. Uh, we are happy to pay for this because the project itself deserves it. Like it's, it's cool to, to say that you'd give us these, but no, we have so much respect for the project that they're doing that, you know, we want to throw that project money. Uh, that's that it, 
that's the the Ben Franklin effect in action, where they've asked for some help and advice on a thing, and you know, months later, my very first thought is, please, can I throw you money? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's very good. It, it's real. You like they printed this comic. It's the stuff Kevin was talking about, where it's not a conceptual thing. It's not an idea for. Uh, a YouTube series. It's not an idea for a comic. No, they do all this stuff. They refine it along the way. Uh, they have gotten to know lots of people in the Create Unknown community. So recruiting some of them uh, for the project seems to have been easy and it's made the project better. I mean, just all these things they have done right. And it's culminated in them getting together uh, at this this convention and having a hard copy of a thing to sell at the table and they made sales they made sales so it's the actual stuff we're talking about on this episode all wrapped up into one uh, and i think you know i've gotten the sense from from talking to them over months that they do get more and more comfortable with with difficult things and things not working out you know they'll post a video and by, by the way if you make 10 youtube videos you realize that one of them has to be 10 out of 10. <laughs> Another one has to be nine out of 10. And this actually goes all the way up to one out of 10. <laughs> when you have 10 of the thing in the YouTube studio, <laughs> they are going to be ranked. Uh, it doesn't mean it's horrible. It just means it's relative performance is a bit different, you know, and like, uh, you do all the stuff, you get comfortable with uh, all the pieces of it. You get comfortable asking uh, for feedback and advice and help and support. It's just all these things. You put that in an actionable project that's real and you feel pretty good. You, you just feel good doing all of this. I didn't feel good early on when I was DIYing everything. And I was, I did, I made some good stuff too. Like I produced really good things, but I didn't feel as good uh, about it as I do now. I wasn't connected to anybody. Kevin's spoken of being on the island. Well, this is this is one of those bridges off the island. Yeah, the island sucks. Get off the it's island. The worst. Get off the island. And and it's it is really nice to see uh, a lot of that happening in the Discord too. With because uh, we have so many creative people in the Discord and seeing them reach out to each other, yeah. collaborate on things, give feedback. That's that's really 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 what it's all about. And you have to give them feedback. You have to have them give feedback on something. That That's the other thing. It's like, who cares about your idea? Just make something. Your idea might be better than the thing that you made. Who cares? That's almost certainly the case. Right. Your like perfect utopian vision of your idea will not meet what it is in reality. <laughs> but no. that's okay. That's no. the process. That's how it works is you have to bridge those two things. You have to bridge the immaculate, like Platonian version of your idea oh. uh, with what it looks like in reality and just kind of go from there. So that's another good thing to keep in mind. Uh, before we wrap up, I, I love this thing that Wifflebutter said in the chat uh, that I'll just read and then comment on, which is it's kind of a, a an aside to our discussion, but it's a, it's a really interesting aside and, and one that I think is true. Wifflebutter says a common pattern I've noticed with creatives who have cubicle jobs is that they feel kind of numb from their work. They look at their older coworkers doing the exact same thing, think that that's going to be me in 10 years if I don't create. And then they have a burning desire to leave the cubicle job. I mean, I could say from my own perspective that I had this feeling immediately when I had a cubicle job for a one week, five days, one work week. And by lunch on the Monday, of day one, I wanted to jump out the window uh, yeah. like that meme from uh, the IT crowd or, or whatever, whatever. There's some, <laughs> is it the IT crowd where the guy that jumps out the window? I think it is. Is it Matthew Barry? Oh, uh, man, I just had to get out of there. And, you know, and I did, you know, not everybody can kind of be crazy enough to say like, you know, I don't need this job and I'll just figure it out. But um, I definitely was. I couldn't handle that. And I think a lot of people can't either. I do know that plenty of people aren't in that position and instead will find ways to fulfill their creativity outside of work. And that makes sense too. You know, you need to 
get it out somehow though. But I, I just, when Wiffle Butter wrote about that scenario in which like a creative person is freaking out in a cubicle job, holy cow. I knew right away. I was like, I feel, I physically feel ill. Have I told this story on the podcast before? How I just kept going to the bathroom. I, re- I see, I don't know if you've told it on the podcast or just told it to me, yeah. but I remember the bathroom part. Yeah. And, and you seeing somebody and thinking seven years from now, if all goes well, that's who I'm going to be and thinking, yeah, I don't want to be that. Yeah. I will have moved from this desk to that desk, you know, 10 feet away <laughs> in seven years. Like that's my trajectory. That is nightmarish to me. Uh, you know, not to everyone, but to me. And I had a physical reaction to it. And my physical reaction to it was I kept feeling like I had to go to the bathroom. It wasn't like I was going to the bathroom to escape the duties of the job. It was like, oh, I have to go again. But I didn't. But my body was like having this freak out where I just had so much anxiety just being there and feeling trapped that, uh, uh, yeah, I just like physically freaked out. It was not good. It was not good. And by the end of it, you know, I, I made it through the five days. I wasn't going to leave before then, but by, on the, on the Friday, you know, I went into my boss's yes. office and was like, Hey, so I can't do this job. And <laughs> I think she was like, no, you can't. I mean, I don't think it was a secret that I was like super unhappy there. <laughs> and I was like, you know, good luck finding your next assistant, but it will not be me. Uh, I, I, I like hearing this stuff and I like, uh, reading about it too, like in the episode chat, because it's, it's really foreign to me. And what I'm about to say is not any kind of brag at all. It's not, but I, I don't, I haven't had motivation to do things ever or not to do them. It's been really neutral. So like, think of it in a very spectrum-y kind of way where it's like, this is not a force that is present in my life for both better and worse. Like I, I've never been crushed by a thing because I wanted it so bad and it didn't work out. No, I've never wanted anything that bad. (laughs) It's so, it's so Zen. You're like accidentally Zen. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly isn't intentional at all, but it's very, uh, you know, kind of monasterial in that way where it's like, I pretty much happy in whatever circumstances, uh, I I'm not, you know, not especially sad in any of them, whatever. Like I, it's very much like I am where I am right now. And that's where I am right now. <laughs> like, like it's total goldfish brained, uh, zilch thought. Um, so, so when I, I, I read a thing like the cubicle things and, and wiffle butter is right. Like we've heard a lot of stories from people. I and lived like, I'm it. in this spot. Yeah. I've heard it from you so many times. And I think, wow, that is, that is such a major driver and motivator that would be awesome to have that force. It would be terrible to have the existential dread associated with it, the misery associated with it, but the drive to get out of that and to get what you want. Oh, that sounds really amazing. If you can harness it. Yeah, I know, but people are weird. I'm weird. Like, There's no rationale behind this because I was so much happier, like working in a sweltering kitchen, being on my feet all day like deep frying chicken wings or carry around, carrying around like, you know, slop buckets and, uh, stepping over vomit. Then I was like working in Manhattan (laughs) on like the, yeah, I don't know, whatever 14th floor of like a beautiful old, like high rise in New York city. That's the dream for a lot of people. You know, that is the height of, privilege good life. and just posh it's absurd like it's an absurd dream life that i could not get away from any faster and it would it would much rather do what i think other people or, or people who would like that job instead would think would be like a horrible job so you never know you know people are weird i'm weird if i could choose yeah if i could do anything right now it would be moving stones and cutting brush i i would like i i'd like to do that every single day and take the occasional day off to go to auctions and let my muscles recover uh i have a really strong varied 
background at this point professionally. I have a decent educational background. There is literally nothing in my life that should point to me wanting to move stones uh, and, and enjoying it that much. But if if I could get out of the game, whatever game that is right now, it, somebody's like, well, here's a good pair of uh, DeWalt headphones with Bluetooth so you can hear an audio book even over the 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 lawnmower engine um i'm like okay is that all cuz i'm all set <laughs> is there is there a bucket to pee in it's yeah because I, I might need that charles Kahn is saying it's your it's your dna and that's exactly the joke i was going to make it's like it's <laughs> yeah. like your caveman dna is screaming to just move stones maybe occasionally swing a club yeah it, it, it's just you know, I know a lot of people hate that kind of thing. You know, they don't like manual labor. They don't like how it feels. They don't like the monotony of it. They get really, really bored with it. And for that, for some reason, that is a feature to me, not a bug. And maybe it's from doing the opposite for so many years where it's like, now I don't want to think about it very much. Uh, I've been watching the great British bake off baking show. What is it? Uh, like, I know yeah. you watch it, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. But I always screw up the name too. Cause I feel like they changed it at some point, but yeah, whatever the great British baking is show, it, I think is what it's called. Wiffle butter says Berenstain bake off. Or Berenstain. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Mandela. Okay. Bake off in the UK. Okay. Uh, got it. There you go. Yeah. I don't have to think when I watch that, you know, with, uh, with another gig, you know, I, I think about the TV shows that I watch to find, you know, things worth commenting on in them, little lessons to pull out of them. Um, I don't, I don't do that with the bake off. I just sit there and watch baking. Bake off more that's like awesome. brain off. Am I right? <laughs> no, that's pretty good. That, that's, that was well-timed because it is absolutely a brain off TV show. Uh, a lobotomy playlist. <laughs> Bobcat says I hate it here. Yeah. That was regrettably, <laughs> regrettably funny. Lobotomy. Lobotomy. Yeah. But I, I'd like to talk about this stuff later. Uh, like in future solo episodes, there are two things that have popped into my head uh, from talking about this. One is, I think we should do an episode on how to have an idea. Okay. Because that's a really basic thing that is at the core uh, of everything. Uh, and I thought about this because Ducky was saying something in the chat and he and I have talked about uh, these two books by Mortimer Adler. Uh, one is called How to Read a Book and the other is called How to Speak and How to Listen. And you'd think that you wouldn't need a whole book on, on those topics, but it's actually, it's a thing to learn how to read a book when there's somebody who is sufficiently experienced in guiding you through that process. Mm -hmm. um, nobody ever talks about how to have an idea, do they? They talk about what to do with your idea. Well, 99 times out of a hundred, they're in, encouraging somebody to engage in a, a process of making a bad idea work. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. they're, they're starting too late. There is something about how do you have an idea? Because you and I both have had a lot of very good ones and a lot of very bad ones. Sure. Sure. At this point, we're a little better at knowing the difference. Yeah, a little better. But sometimes you still are really sure that you have a good idea. And then a month later, you're like, I hate that idea. <laughs> and that definitely happens to me. Um, but I, but, what I have gotten better at is knowing when I'm in the state of being drunk on the idea. Because mm. now I can know that, oh, I am like completely high on this idea. And that is not a good proxy for understanding whether it's good or not. That's a thing. At least that's a thing for me. Where I will be like wasted like on an idea being like, holy gosh, this is like the greatest idea I've ever had. And that, that feeling fades as if you were like, you know, coming down off of a high. I don't know how else to describe it. It's like an incredible first date where you're like, I want to marry you're this like, person. Oh, I'm so in love and then, with this idea. Yeah. Yeah. And then halfway through the second date, you've identified seven deal breakers that annoy the piss out of you. Well, we've actually talked that to <laughs> like every animation person we've talked to has mentioned fighting through that when it comes to joke writing. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at Boss Thread saying, I saw the idea without makeup. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, you woke up the next morning with the idea. Yeah, and, you're like, uh, oh, I don't, I don't know. And a hangover. No longer in love with this idea. Yeah. 
was it Pebbles who talked about the jokes holding up after they all the have. 17th hour? They all have. Yeah. Meat Canyon, Pebbles, mm-hmm. all right. James. It's like the number one thing with animators is that they think they have this hilarious thing. They've made them laugh. They think it's really funny. And then, yeah, like 300 hours later of working on this joke, they're like, don't think it's funny at all and just have to go with the fact that at one point they did think it was funny. And that's yeah. like a totally different problem, really. What I'm talking about is, yeah, not falling too in love with, I don't know, maybe you should fall in love with the joke or with the idea to begin with, but not always. It's one of those tight ropes. Yeah, you don't know. Yeah, it's you don't a, know. It's, you have to be appropriately obsessed with the thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, how do you figure out what that is? It's hard. That's really hard. Uh-oh. Well, good. Now that we're at the end, we've officially gone back to making no progress. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, we have uh, we have an idea for our next solo episode, which will be how to have an idea. We didn't complain, really. I thought we were going to complain more, and that kind of didn't happen. So maybe we'll have to also carve out some more complaining time in a future episode. What we need to do is come up with a list of complaints and then treat it like, pardon the interruption on ESPN. Okay. Where each complaint has like two minutes of right. hot take slash complaint Countdown. and we just machine gun mm-hmm. our grievances. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. All right. Uh, Oki next week and a reminder to right. follow Oki's Weird Stories on Twitter. Check out Oki's channel so you can catch up with the type of documentaries that he's been making. And uh, yeah, we're going to find out what's been going on in the Wild West lately. So uh, looking forward to that. Until then, we are out of here and we'll see you, Space Cowboys. Thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. We make this show with the support of our patrons. 100% of that goes directly to keeping episodes going every week. And the recent support has been amazing. Sidpoke, NRM, Venture Addicts, Weezer Good, you all really do make this show happen. Thank you to the Tots and Dumpster crew, old and new, who save tiny little lives every month. Thank you to our grizzled, battle-hardened child infantry. Clemente De Los Santos, Dan the Latch, Demetrius Andrews, Erica, Farrakhan, Jen Mefasanti, Kevin Menard, Mikhail Steinke, Monahim, Natsu, Penny Peddler, Risebread, Ryan Kinder, Samuel Manser, Sean S., Sean Malone, and Tom Videoger. And a tremendous shout out to our elite baby gang commanders. Atrocious Guff, Cat, Dojangles, Graham Robertson, James Gallagher, Jeff Davis, Orange Vanilla Coke, Patrick Pister, TCU's personal pilot, Andy, Ryan Carroll, Baseweight, Vinthos, Yetis Deletus, Jonas Walter, Nathan Robinson, Chelksies, and of course, Trevstead. You are the elite. Thank you as well to our indentured servants, producer editor Ben Webster, Minecraft mogul Laterman, Discord kitten wrangler Conrad, and producer emeritus Dan Yoshua. Thanks to Baseweight for use of Created in the Unknown for the opening theme. Thanks to Electro Voice for giving us mics to sound good on top of it. And a special thanks to Main Gear for powering all of our PC endeavors. The Create Unknown is an unknown media production in partnership with Studio 71.